Welcome to Henry Winston Unity Hall. I want to welcome y'all on behalf of the We're Not Going Back Host Committee. Um, but before I begin um, with the theme of today's event, I want us to give a moment of silence and a rest in peace to Tokwe Lumumba. Oh, please stand. Please stand for this moment of silence. Today we come together to discuss the struggle to defeat racism and its central role in defeating the agenda of the ultra-right. It has been almost two months since a historic election in this city where a multi-most racial coalition of progressive politicians ousted a 20-year racist Republican machine from City Hall. They united with labor and people's organizations to fight inequality and swept the election to city government. Public advocate Letitia James, the Working Families Party leader, public advocate from Brooklyn, is the first African-American woman to win city by <laughs> Melissa Mark Viverito, a Puerto Rican woman from East Harlem, is the speaker of the city council and the chair of its progressive caucus, which is its leading caucus. Our mayor, Bill de Blasio, has in, 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 in the less than two months that his administration has been in leadership, has withdrawn the appeal to stop and frisk. Yeah. Has declared a moratorium on school closures and co-locations. Yeah. And has called for the issuance of municipal identification to all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. We are in a turning point in New York City. This turning point is the result of years of coalition of hard work in the grassroots by labor, by nationally oppressed, by women's organizations, by a people's coalition who is now the majority of New York City. New York City is 70% nationally oppressed. One million union members live in this city. But for 20 years, this racist regime was able to rule. We weren't able to defeat them with all the majority that we had. We weren't able to defeat them until this multiracial coalition took anti-racism as its unifying point. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. This is the way to defeat the right wing. When New York City saw Dante speak on that TV screen about stop and frisk, about what it was to walk down the street of New York City as a young black male, the people of this city responded to that message. When advocates for public education, and when I say advocates, I'm talking about parents, I'm talking about teachers, I'm talking about students, when they came together to address the fact that although we live in a city that has Wall Street, the richest city in human history, that in neighborhoods like Brownsville, in the My Haven section of the South Bronx, college readiness is 6%. When they saw that there was a slate, that there was a movement that was ready to fight to reverse that, our city was mobilized. Our city united, and our city won. <laughs> Today we have a wonderful panel that is going to be able to speak about these questions and more. The, well, first I would like to welcome, I think everybody <laughs> came here for someone special. <laughs> 
Angela Davis. We all saw that wonderful movie that was in the theaters. Michael Schulman. Michael is the, 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 the executive board member of the United Federation of Teachers. And, and John Sina, the executive vice chair of the Communist Party USA. But before I hand, out, uh, hand over the program to these heavy hitters, I would like to invite a very special person out to the stage who's going to be the host for this evening's events. Susan DeRango actually just got off the bus from Albany fighting for funding for higher education. Susan DeRango has been a delegate of the Professional Staff Congress, I'm sorry, delegate of the Professional Staff Congress for the past 10 years. And she has been working in CUNY for the past 30 years. She has been fighting for education, educating the young people of our city, and you might have seen her on the weekends up by on Van Cortland Park uh, doing the food pantry. Uh, but please come on up, Susan DeRango. Just one thing I want to add to what Esteban said is when I went up to Albany, we told the legislators that student debt today is one trillion dollars. It's more debt than mortgage debt. So we were up there asking for funds because they've defunded CUNY. The City University of New York serves half a million students in New York, yet the legislature has stopped giving us funds. Because in uh, the 70s, when uh, minorities came to CUNY, that's when they started defunding it. So, uh, so I just wanted to add that. But I'd love to introduce Jarvis Tyner, who comes to us from uh, West Philadelphia. He had the foresight to become active at a very young age, 20 years old. And I'm inviting everyone in this audience to become active. Um, he was a member of the Amalgamated uh, Lithographers of America. He, he was a founding member of the Young Workers Liberation League, and he ran for vice president in 1972 and 76. But he's been a tireless fighter for equality. But I, I had the pleasure of working with him because I was the New York press director for many years of the Communist Party, and he was working there with me. So without further delay, I'd like to... Good evening, everybody. Y'all look good, let me tell you. <laughs> so glad you all came out. Uh, so proud to share the platform with these distinguished fighters in a special way with uh, Angela Yvonne Davis, whose courage is legendary, who stood up to the most powerful people in the world when they declared her a terrorist and guilty and so forth. Time Magazine put her picture on the cover. Ebony did too, once or twice. <laughs> and her picture was in every post office. And she made the decision that she was going to come back in and lead a fight because she knew she was innocent. And in doing that, she showed a deep confidence in you all, in the people, that you would defend her because truth would set you free and set her free. Go see Free Angela. It's a great movie. Not that I have a cameo in it, but uh, <laughs> but it just tells that story the way it really happened. It is so powerful. And the NAAC Image Award is going to that movie 
and Shyla, who uh, directed and produced the movie. So that's a real high recognition as far as I'm concerned. Since from the 16th to the 19th to the 18th century, 12 million Africans were kidnapped from Africa, put in chains. Some of them marched across the continent, put in chains, and sent in the holes, the bowels, literally, of the boat to come to the United States against their will and to be slaves for life. You know they were white indentured servants before that. They were actually some of the Africans were indentured servants before that, and they said, but this is not working. We need to, we got cotton, we got tobacco, we got, we need these people forever. Slaves for life. Um, for those 12 million people were spread throughout the hemisphere. Only 645,000 came to what we call the United States. They were in the Caribbean, Latin America, Brazil, uh, all, all Central America, all over the hemisphere. So every single one of you folks in this room is related. On one level, to those 12 million Africans who are born You don't have to look after Africans to be related, and we are. So this is our struggle. And I often think, I often think that every generation that comes about has to pick up the torch of struggle, has to pick up the torch of struggle and freedom and keep the struggle going. That is our responsibility. And that is why we're here tonight. I'm assuming when everybody in this room, you're ready to pick up that torch and carry out that struggle. Of course, slaves were sold like a commodity. They were human commodities because the whole system of American capitalism used slavery as a way to accumulate the initial wealth for the country. And when they say, we don't belong here, or this is a white country and all this other thing, nothing could be further from the truth. All the wonderful things written on the parchments, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence was tame, tainted by the fact that every single one of the founding fathers until they some of them got a little light had slaves. By 1860, the slave population in the United States was of 4 million out of a population of 31 million. It's a pretty high percentage, actually. There were also African, people African said, who were not slaves. But they were nowhere near a majority. But they waged a struggle for freedom that forced the majority of this country to reject the system of slavery and inequality. They were courageous. As far as I'm concerned, what has kept me going, I'm sure what has kept most of you going, and I'm sure what Angela was thinking when sitting in that jail for 18 months. We cannot give up this struggle. We have to continue to fight, and we can win. Well, the reason we say that the racism is key to defeating the right wing, because they put so much stock in convincing people that people of color are inferior and that are in fact the source of all the problems in the nation. I heard Bill Riley the other day say that you can boo him. Say <laughs> that our youth in the African American Latino communities, because there were so many shootings and killings, were committing genocide. Now can you imagine? This guy who apologizes for racism every day he's on it, for most racism every day he's on it. And he said that our black youth were carrying out genocide. Well, we don't want our black youth to do what some of them have done. But who put the drugs in our community? 
Who bought the guns in the community? And who took away the entry level jobs that manufactured and shipped them overseas and left our young people the only industry is selling drugs? Who did that? Thank you. <laughs> so, so I say to you, the real crimes are not in the street, they're in the suites of big corporations. That's why we say, and that, and that is a curious deal. That what unites people. The election of Obama could only be possible if millions, tens of millions of Americans had to think through all the racism and anti-communism, red baiting, and so forth that they were putting on Obama and say, hell no. They grew in the process of that. In fact, that growth thing is the biggest achievement of the election of the first black president. And it has sparked movements all over this country we didn't have before. Fast food workers. You see, you can't do nothing about McDonald's, you can't do Now those workers are the most militant. They want to revitalize the labor movement. I'm telling you. The call for a $15 uh, minimum wage, raising the minimum wage, fantastic. You don't think that affects corporate America and capitalism? You're talking about sharing the wealth now. They ain't for that. But if most Americans are for that, taxing the rich. I remember when I ran, I when I ran for uh, right from the United States and I said taxing the rich, the reporter broke out laughing. Right, yeah, they ain't gonna, you're gonna tax the rich, you're kidding, they run everything. It is now a majority view in the country. Movements, like what is happening in North Carolina. See? All on Monday, we didn't have anything uh, like that. The head of the AFL CIO saying to his white working workers in the unions, he's saying, look, if you use race and vote for McCain, it's like a chicken voting for Colonel Sanders. <laughs> and he's right. And Leo Gerard the other day said, we have been fighting and fighting on this question. And what did we discover? We discovered that this right wing that refuses to let things come through Congress that benefit us, they don't want to do it because they don't like a black president. He said, that's just a white trade union leader. That is the reason why they don't want to do it. These are changes that we cannot take lightly. And we cannot fall into a notion that because we have longer term views, you know our views on that, we want socialism. We can't put that against fighting for immediate demands. In fact, let me tell you something, you don't fight for the immediate demands of the working people, they will never follow you to socialism. That's a fact. And I'll tell you, you may hope it's different, and that they'll say, oh, how smart you were. All the while we were fighting for the minimum wage, all the while we were fighting for affordable housing, you were standing on the side saying, no, 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 socialism, no, no, no. And now we realize you're so brilliant. That ain't gonna happen. They want you beside them, side by side, to fight for what is destroying their lives every day. We've got to save this country. That's what it's all about. I've got three more minutes. Why do we say the right wing is the main problem? Because they are the main answer. It doesn't mean Democrats don't make those mistakes, and they're right wing the Democratic Party. But we can't defeat them all in one felt swoop. You know that. Think about it. Think about it. But on issues, we have a majority in this country, a whole bunch of issues. These are the people, the main people, who are blocking union rights and the rights of working people to organize union, which for our people has been a magnificent way to change their standard of living and to be able to raise their family and live a decent and dignified life. Who's pushing voter suppression all over the country? Who's opposed to the minimum wage increase? Who is against women's right to choose? Who's pushing the main force on stand your ground and stop and frisk and the calling for the mass incarceration of black and Latino youth? Uh, by the way, it's an aside, I think they should legalize marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Why? 
Because I want to get out. Because it is a weapon, this thing they use to jail our young people. Unjustly. These are the ones who oppose any kind of gun control. Who the main opposition to saving public education. They want to eliminate. Extending unemployment benefits, these are the main people they voted against that. Who is the most opposed to immigrant rights and the democratic path to citizenship? Those ultra-right elements in the Congress. You've got to face that. This is real. Who is the main proponent to cut Section 8 and food stamps? That right-wing group in the Congress. The main component. Who is the main obstacle to stopping global warming and for green and against green jobs and green future? Who is for the rollback of all the reforms of the New Deal and for the destruction of Social Security? They are nevertheless, but they're doing all that. And we know who they are. They created the conditions and then they come back and say it's your fault that we're in this situation. <laughs> But they are fighting for their political life. Quietness is kept as powerful as they have, as much more. They are fighting for their political life. The main base of the Tea Party and the right wing Republicans is in the South. I'm telling you, the Republican Party will collapse if it loses the South. This is really important to understand that. It will collapse if it loses uh, the South. That's why Moral Mondays is so important. That's why when Obama won North Carolina, they panicked. And they poured in all his money. In 12, Obama lost North Carolina, but he can win it, or they can be defeated again in North Carolina. You see, um, what I'm saying, who you, who you elect to public office means something. It ain't no joke. Especially as the crisis of capitalism gets worse and worse. They put, they're going to put the weight of that on working people increasingly, which is destructive to the whole country. That this right wing base has big bucks from the Koch brothers, Koch brothers, who are carrying on a massive campaign across this country. They are really continuing the legacy of Jim Crow. That's who they attract, that's who they, that's who they finance, that's who they want to win. People, it matters who you elect a public office. We have to be a part of those who are for defeating the right wing Republican majority in the House and who, who want to turn back the clock because we want to turn the clock forward. Right now in Arizona, the legislature has passed a Jim Crow pro law against gay people. You know about that. <laughs> yeah. That will allow stores and restaurants to deny service to anyone who they think is gay. It's a nightmare. Imagine that. We're going to go table to table and ask some 10 questions. <laughs> and the guy says, this is the struggle for religious freedom. I say, what church are you in? The KKK church? <laughs> but this is where that idea comes from. Now we know. We know what they stand for. Ron Paul, this is a quote libertarian, and some seem to kind of like on the left, I don't understand it, but they do. He said that the Civil Rights Bill was okay, I did vote against it, my dad did vote against it, but it's okay. But he says, I don't agree with it being applied in the private sector. Well, if we don't apply in the private sector, the majority of the country, that means in effect it won't get applied. He said, I think it's okay in the public sector because that's what people pay for. What kind of bullshit is that? <laughs> but that's the kind of guy he is, and he may be the candidate of that part. This is not a time to retreat, and the people are not retreating. They are not. They're moving. They're fighting. They picked up the torch. We are not going back. That's the other thing. We are not going back. On most of these issues, the administration is against what the right wing is pushing. Some other issues we don't agree with them. But on most of these issues, they're against what the right wing is pushing. So in conclusion, I say, this must not be a repeat, this election year of 2010. 2014 
must be a historic setback for the extreme right. Then we will go forward towards the new progressive era. They are the main obstacle to that. Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> So yesterday in the, uh, in the Assembly of New York State, they passed the New York Dream Act, which is a great <laughs> success, but, but, but we're not there yet because now it has to go to the Senate. So we need all of you to call your state senators who don't even want to put it on the floor. But the governor said if it gets to his desk, he will sign it. And the New York Dream Act would guarantee tuition for undocumented students. So please. And I'm just mentioning this because as uh, Esteban said, I was up there. And next week, uh, my children uh, will be going up there. And all of that is to say how Mike Shulman has worked very hard for the teachers, his, uh, the UFT, has uh, tried to stop the onslaught of testing uh, to, to the students. Because we know that testing tries to stop students from progressing, getting into the colleges, and that's uh, where I am, as, as was mentioned. Those tests have tried to keep them out over the years. So uh, we're going to hear from uh, my children now. Susan. Uh, good evening, everyone. And it's a, uh, not only a pleasure, but an honor to share the platform with Jarvis and especially with Angela. Um, when I uh, began first in my, uh, I cut my first political teeth uh, when Henry Winston issued a call for people to get active in the Free Angela campaign. And that was one of my first political efforts. And, uh, Fortunately for all of us, we were successful in that struggle. Um, I just wanted to add, those who don't know me, I was also a, I'm a member of the executive board of this union. I uh, ran from a uh, rank and file slave and co-chair of uh, New Action Caucus, which is a group within the UFT that fought Albert Schenker, that fought Sandra Feldman around the issues of really fighting for what's good for teachers and what's good for students. So we were involved in that, in that fight and uh, currently I am a member of, uh, one of the people who helped form the UFT Social and Economic Justice Committee, which has played a very large role in, uh, in um, I wanted to, as I was thinking about addressing the issue of uh, fight, the fight against racism as the, as really a necessary fight in order to turn around the ultra-right in this country, I began looking at a couple of questions that I posed to myself and I thought I would put out to the audience today, uh, perhaps is the best way to get into my main point, which how is we need to build unity in the struggle to win uh, all of these advances, immediate advances and long-range advances that Jarvis uh, spoke about. And as I thought about it, and I, of course, uh, Jarvis took a lot of the steam out of what I was going to say, but the fight, around, uh, the fight around the minimum wage, how that benefits all working people and all families and communities. Uh, the latest fight around immigration, is key to that, and I'm so glad to hear what Susan had said about uh, the DREAM Act. Um, also, the fight against this voter suppression is a major issue to advance. This is precisely, not only does it have that racist edge, but it is directed at every progressive movement and every uh, democratic direction that we can take this union. It's an attempt to reverse all of the gains that working people and people of color have made in this country. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the struggle against this today with de Blasio in New York City, the struggle around pre-K, universal pre-K, how key that is in the fight to improve conditions for children and 
parents and communities. So we take a look at what's happening in terms of uh, uh, the youth and, and, and the questions of women and the question, all of these questions. Uh, the cutting edge is uh, what do we need to reverse these, uh, these attempts to roll back all the gains that working people in this country have made. And, and the key, I think, is the question of, uh, we understand, is the question of building unity and building alliances to turn things around. But just as we understand that, the ruling class of this country understands that they have to undermine unity. It's the only thing that we have to really move the struggle forward, the struggle for immediate gains and the struggle eventually to socialism. Uh, we just have to look and take a look at what's happened over these past couple of years with the election job spoke about, the first elected black president in this country, and how this ultra right wing has attempted to block every movement to advance the interests of working people, people of color. All we have to do is take a look at this struggle around the extension of unemployment benefits today. How does the prevention of this stop? How does it advance the, the uh, middle class, the working class? It doesn't. But that's precisely the agenda for this, uh, this ruling class. And that is to deny any advancements and any gains that can be made. Uh, all we have to take a look at is, uh, is the use of this issue of racism, the ideological use of it. Uh, this is the key element, Jarvis mentioned also, red bait and anti-communism, the tools of this class, of this ruling class to divide our people. So they understand that, this, uh, that the only way that they can accomplish this is both by uh, very sophisticated control of the media. Control. I often listen and I wonder how they say this is a liberal medium when every time you turn a channel, it's another talking head from the right wing who's promoting this racist ideology, this anti-working class ideology. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a, a, a long, hard road. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult proposition for us to, to uh, counter this, but counter it we will. There are so many examples that Jarvis was talking about and Sue just mentioned. The fight around immigration rights, the DREAM Act. The fight to extend benefits, unemployment benefits. Um, we see what's been playing out in the last number of years. It's easy to overstate how dire the situation is in our country. But I don't think the statistics have come in that show just how bad the situation is in our country. And it's, and it's mainly because of the use of this weapon of dividing uh, labor, people of color, our allies out there in the movement for advancement. But it is a dire situation. I don't have to tell that to anyone in this room. But uh, we cannot, we ha I don't think we have the projection of just how bad the issue of poverty is, just the issue of how many children go to bed, families go to bed at night without food, who send their kids in the morning to schools who don't have a breakfast to eat. And all of this is, is a part of the agenda to roll back uh, all of the advances that I spoke about. Uh, while the policies of the uh, extreme right falls especially hard on people of color, it also impacts on working people as a whole. I mentioned what's needed is a broadly based and sustained struggle for economic justice and full equality. That doesn't mean that the poison of ruling class ideology no longer has an impact. But the working class has a strategic role to play. Its role is uh, strategic to the extent success of the movement as a whole. And I want to put this out there, labor cannot. I'm a labor person, I've been a trade unionist, I've been a teacher for 36 years and active in my union. But labor alone cannot win this struggle. It has to be won by an alliance with people of color, women, immigrants, and youth. Uh, in other words, broad unity is the path out of this crisis. 
and the path to building the movement which will progress to socialism. I take a little bit of pride, I just want to mention, and maybe I'm not supposed to do this as a speaker, kind of pat, uh, pat myself on the back. I'm not patting myself on the back. But I will say that the people, and there are many in the room who are educators who have been struggling around the question of social justice and economic justice, not just as trade unionists fighting around a contract for improved working conditions. That alone would be an important achievement, but fighting for children and what's good for children. And what's important is that uh, this uh, group of people who have been active in the trade union movement and who have fought right-wing social democracy for many years, Jarvis mentioned that, it's not a struggle that takes place overnight. What are we at? Gotcha. Uh, overnight. Uh, but it is a, a, a struggle that has to take place continuously. Um, I know that in the uh, working with the teachers movement, uh, we were the first to call for an end to stop and frisk that led to that magnificent demonstration in New York City. We were the first to call for justice to Trayvon Martin in this movement. And we were the first to go on the record for and on behalf of the DREAM Act. And as a matter of fact, last month alone, we put forward a resolution to go to our state federation that called for honoring Nelson Mandela for the contribution of the So I'll end on this. Uh, I'll just end on this note um, that the policies of the extreme right fall especially hard on uh, nationally oppressed. It also negatively impacts on working people at a whole, as a whole. What is urgently needed is a broadly based, sustained struggle for economic justice and full equality. And this, uh, and this means that uh, we have to hold out great hope through struggle in identifying uh, the divisive role that racism plays, the very, that the very notion of racism can not only be challenged, but can be overcome. So thank you. Uh, before we continue, we'd like to acknowledge Charlene Mitchell, who's in the audience. <laughs> Uh, and we'd also like to call up uh, Audrey Starr. Come on, Audrey. history. It was written in 1900 and it was written by James Johnson. Yes? I'm sorry, what was that? Yes? James Roman Johnson. And did I get that right? <laughs> okay, but it's, it, the significance of this song is it's, it's so deep, so I hope I can do it justice for you. And if you know the words, can you sing along? Just because I, I need the way in my head. We're not going back. And this song embodies just what that is. We're not going back. It's a song that talks about the toiling of the people. And reasons is a little bit. Lift every voice and sing to Let it resign. 
Thank you, Audrey Starr, for another wonderful performance. So I just wanted to make three quick announcements before our um, main event. Uh, first, to help carry forward African American History Month and its mission to help defeat racism in the far right today. If you want to purchase Angela Davis's biography and ask her, hopefully, to sign it. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, uh, International Publishers has a table back there with Betty Smith. Um, Betty, where you at us? I guess I didn't put um, and uh, also there, there's a bunch of literature there from the different um, authors who wrote, who, uh, who, who uh, are, are authors of the readings that we're going to be having the class on. Um, I know everybody noticed in the seats before you sat down, there's basically a form describing uh, a seminar that we're going to be beginning. Um, and it, is, it describes a four session series covering African American history from 1613 to the present and showing how that history is a weapon in today's fight against racism. So we're hoping that you know, every, everybody or a lot of you who are here today will sign up for that class and we can continue this work you know, going forward. So those are, um, you're, you're either you're sitting on them or they're in your lap. So you know, if you only got a pen, just raise your hand and I will get one to you and I'm gonna get it back too. And please hand the, uh, the form, just rip off the form that's on the back of it and, uh, and hand it to us and there'll be us coming up the aisle. Um, and if you want, if you're interested in more reading, we have a more thorough list of these requests. Okay, so uh, for our main speaker, uh, I just have two minutes to introduce her. So I'd like to talk about how um, in 1984, uh, Angela ran for vice president, and uh, many of us, uh, yes, great that she did it, and uh, many of us went around the country petitioning to get her on the ballot, and I, I went to California to do it, and uh, I went to San Diego, and everyone was, don't go to San Diego, they're very reactionary there. But fortunately, people understood that uh, Angela stood for justice, stood for equality, and many people signed the petition. But I'd like to fast forward to, uh, to her recent work, because she's been working recently uh, for prisoners' rights, uh, and she's the founder of Critical uh, Resistance, an organization working to abolish the prison industrialization complex. Uh, and, I, and I talk to my students about that because, you know, in the United States they're spending more money to keep people in prison than they are spending for a college education. But I believe they should spend money for people who are in jail, but they should let them out, really, right? That's what we want. We want it to be abolished, spend money, get them out of jail. Um, anyhow, but so... Uh, Angela Davis also, as we all know, has many interests in feminism, African-American studies, and uh, as Esteban mentioned, she's written many books, she's traveled. So without further words, I'd like to just present her and thank her for all her hard work. As well. Uh, and it's wonderful to see Charlie 
Kelly Mitchell here as well. Regardless, evokes, well, others have evoked the campaign for my uh, freedom. Uh, but I have to tell you, I was in jail the whole time. The work was done by people uh, out in the free world, uh, and, and Charlene Mitchell was the one who coordinated the work. And since I am here in this part of the country, I would like to, um, well, not since I'm here, because I have paid tribute to Amiri Baraka uh, everywhere. specifically to speak about the importance of understanding and challenging racism, especially within the context of the damage uh, wrought by the emboldened conservative forces in, in this country. And I have about um, no more than 30 minutes to do that. Uh, so let me begin by um, by saying that racism has played such a central role in shaping the economic, political, and social history of this country. There are those who assume that with the triumphs associated with the civil rights movement, the country was purged of racism. In other words, the, the dismantling of the legal structures of racism is often assumed to be the end of racism per se. And this is why we, we hear uh, uh, about colorblindness. This is why people are under the impression that, that an end to racism uh, is equivalent to uh, legal uh, colorblindness. Uh, and then there are those who like to point to the fact that the election of Barack Obama amounted to the ultimate defeat of racism in this country. And of course, if that's the case, we must be inhabiting an era of the post-racial. But sometimes it seems that the very presence of a black president in Washington has unleashed countless instances of the overt racism that many of us have thought Not only the, 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 uh, the, the kinds of racism with which we are familiar, but also relatively new instantiations of racism, the vicious anti-Muslim racism that is characteristic of the post 9-11 era. Now we are here on the second anniversary of the killing of Trayvon uh, Martin. And, uh, it's uh, really wonderful that, uh, that there have been demonstrations and marches today here in New York and all over the, the country. Uh, and of course we know that it's not about um, the life of a single indi individual, however important uh, Trayvon's life uh, may have been, but it's about a systematic uh, um, racist violence. We can see it today with the, the incarceration of Marissa Alexander in, in Florida, the killing of Jordan Davis uh, um, for playing what loud music uh, in North. I think in North Carolina, Jonathan Farrell, who was uh, attempting to get help after having had an automobile accident and was shot by the police. I can give so many examples of, 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 of racist violence that are still with us, not because racism and violence are natural human proclivities, which is why some people assume that racism will always be with us, uh, uh, but rather because of what we may call the structural racism that has not been fundamentally troubled since the era of slavery. Um, 
In fact, I think we can say that even as legal institutions of racism have been dismantled, structural racism has become even more strongly embedded in the economic and educational and correctional and healthcare institutions of this country. Now, I don't think it's, uh, it's good to underestimate the importance of the civil rights movement. Uh, but the triumph of civil rights was not the end of racism. And Dr. King came to acknowledge what he called the, the triple dangers of racism, militarism, and he said materialism. But I think that was a euphemism for capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> so we can say racism, materialism, and capitalism. And, um, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote um, this monumental work, Black Reconstruction in America, in 1935. Eric Williams wrote Capitalism and Slavery in 1944. But there are still those who try to resist the implications of this link between capitalism and slavery for our uh, world today. And this is Black History Month, so should, we should reflect on that. Uh, um, what is the meaning of black history? I was, uh, not long ago, I was speaking at an elementary school in Oakland. I tried to um, uh, spend time in classrooms during Black History Month sometimes, and the, um, uh, this one class of kids uh, started to ask me, um, did you know Dr. Martin Luther King? And I said, yeah, I actually met, I met him on several occasions. Did you know Malcolm X? Uh, did you know Rosa Parks? It was really interesting. They, they got going. And then somebody said, did you know Harriet Tubman? <laughs> of this country as, as really a history of slavery. 
because we like to relegate that really bad part of the history to, we like to segregate it uh, uh, in the past. We don't like to think about the implications for the present. Douglas Blackman has a quite an amazing, uh, a very troubling um, book. Uh, the content is very troubling. Uh, and the name of the book is Slavery by Another Name. The Re-Enslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II. And so what he argues is that slavery did not end until the 1940s when the convict lease system was finally abolished. So that would mean that we've had 320 years of slavery and only about 70 um, without slavery. Whichever way you look at it, the majority of this country's history has been a history of slavery. But if you consider the extent to which slavery has been relegated to a place of historical insignificance, you would never know that the majority of this country's history is unfolded on slavery or under slavery. And we have to say that Jarvis uh, 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 very eloquently uh, evoked uh, the um, horrendous conditions of slavery. It was not some insignificant aberration. The fact that human beings were bought and sold and legally treated as property. The fact that human beings were forced to labor under the most despicable conditions. That, that, that um, human beings were sexually abused, that they were not even recognized as human beings. This was a catastrophe that had vast implications that would influence the history, the culture, the collective psyche of this country for many, many decades to come. The fact that there has never been a serious and consistent attempt to purge the economy, the politics, the culture, and the spirit of the United States of this catastrophe has allowed it to continue to spew its damage uh, decade after decade after decade. Now, speaking about history, uh, the period after the constitutional abolition of slavery uh, which did not fully abolish slavery, uh, but that period from 1865 to about 1877, uh, a little more than a decade, that was the most radical period in the history of this country. And not simply in terms of efforts to um, uh, roll back the efforts to challenge the, 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 the consequences of the racism related to slavery, but it was progressive in terms of workers' rights. It was progressive in terms of educational rights in general, because white children in the South, poor white children, working class white children, had never had the opportunity to get an education until black people fought for the first public education systems in the South. Progressive, very progressive legislation uh, with respect to women's rights, uh, div div new divorce laws, uh, laws that allowed women to own property. Uh, and um, we have no sense of that here. It has been completely um, concealed. Uh, uh, a divorce wrote. That, and I think Black Reconstruction is uh, a book that everybody in this country should read. And uh, the voice wrote that after the dismantling of radical reconstruction, uh, that democracy died. Democracy died except in the hearts of black people. And I think that uh, uh, this um, the connection between the struggle against racism and the struggle for democracy in this country has always been uh, a, 
uh, so intense uh, uh, that um, uh, if we're going to launch an effort to defeat racism today, we certainly have to keep these uh, uh, historical uh, 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 linkages in mind. Um, I spoke about this book by Douglas uh, Blackman. Uh, Douglas Blackman argues that that we should not talk about the, the era that led up to the uh, triumph of the civil rights movement, 64, 65, Civil Rights Act, and so on. But we should not call it Jim Crow. And he says it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually quite amazing that we name an era that was, uh, 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 that, that, that brought about such violence uh, uh, as after a white minstrel figure, after a white man in blackface performing uh, on the minstrel stage. So what he argues is that we should not call that era Jim Crow. We should call it the age of neo-slavery. We should call it the age of neo-slavery because what characterized that period more than anything else was uh, the over-exploitation of the labor of uh, formerly enslaved black people uh, in ways that oftentimes were even worse than slavery. Yeah. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham was called the Pittsburgh of the South. And that was because there was a lot of iron ore that was mined, and then U.S. Steel, and Tennessee coal iron, and railroad came and constructed these huge steel mills. And so you had the, the beginnings of the industrialization of the South. Now, all of this was based on slave labor. It was in the aftermath of slavery, but the punishment system that came to be called the convict lease system was um, an effort to manage uh, black bodies in the aftermath of the so-called abolition of, of slavery. Um, and it's, I mean, it's so interesting that there have been quite a number of works written about this, but we still have no sense of the impact of this labor system on our history. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the, one of the uh, books that was written in the 90s was uh, by a professor by the name of Milford Fierce, uh, who uh, uh, was teaching at Brooklyn College, and it was called Slavery Revisited, uh, Blacks and the Southern Convict Lease System. And then David Oshinsky wrote a, a, a book called Worse Than Slavery, Parchment Farm and the Ordeal of Jim Crow Justice. And then Matthew Mancini, Mancini wrote a book called One Dies, Get Another. And the point that he was making was that at least the slave, the slave owners had an investment in, in, in keeping the people uh, alive whose labor they were exploiting. But the convict lease system did not require those who were leasing out uh, uh, the slaves to keep them alive. They could literally work them to death and get another one uh, because they were leasing them by the month. And so I learned uh, that in the city where I grew up, there were, there were slave camps everywhere. Slave camps uh, next to the mines, the iron ore mines, next to the coal mines. Uh, uh, slaves were the ones who were the first workers in the mills. Uh, and so this is a really important part of labor history uh, that we don't necessarily uh, take into cons consideration. Um, um, and this, 
The exploitation of black labor depended on the criminalization of blackness. And so you had all these laws passed, like vagrancy uh, laws, uh, laws that uh, required people to have permission to change em employees. You could be arrested for changing <coughs> employers without permission. And then it turns out that it's not primarily the southern racists, the old slaveocracy that was responsible uh, for the growth of, of, of the system. It was companies like U.S. Steel, the northern capitalist uh, 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 concerns that used this convict uh, labor. And according to the research that Blackman did, it wasn't about, uh, oh, um, yes, uh, black people have not been, have not had the experience of freedom that long. So they don't understand what it means uh, to steal something. Uh, they, don't, uh, they, don't, they haven't yet acquired the, 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 the ethical uh, uh, sense that, uh, uh, that might prevent them from committing crimes. Uh, and, 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 and what Blackman does is that he, he looks at the records in courts and he looks at the, uh, the records of U.S. Steel and he discovers that the rise in the numbers of, of, of people arrested is directly correlated to the demand for cheap labor. Wow. And so what happens is that U.S. Steel um, tells the sheriffs, and every sheriff was involved in this. This is you know, one of the reasons why Southern sheriffs have such a bad rep. Uh, and then we can, we can uh, think about the role of the sheriffs for the civil rights era. But every sheriff was involved in that business of, of, of leasing out slaves, basically. And U.S. Steel would simply announce that they need, need more people. And then there, there would be roundups. There would be roundups. People would be arrested for all kinds of reasons. And this, this is one of the, this is a, um, a passage from this book. Instead of evidence showing black crime waves, the original records of county jails indicated thousands of arrests for inconsequential charges or for violations of law specifically written to intimidate blacks. Changing employers without permission, vacancy, riding freight cars without a ticket, engaging in sexual activity or loud talk with white women. Repeatedly, he wrote, the timing and scale of surges and arrests appeared more attuned to rises and dips in the need for cheap labor than any demonstrable acts of crime. Hundreds of forced labor camps came to exist. Uh, all over the country, violence that terrorized uh, black people. But it was the return of that forced labor system, he writes, as a fixture in black life that ground more pervasively into the lives of far more African Americans. And looking at that helps us to understand the context of the rise of a prison industrial complex. That history helps us to understand how it is we have become a prison nation and how racism and the criminalization of blackness has fueled that prison nation. Why the U.S. has the largest popu incarcerated population in the world, why such a disproportionate number of them are black and are people of color. I mean, it may no longer be the case that people are incarcerated uh, because U.S. still needs cheap labor. Uh, but I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> but it certainly is the case that prisoners' bodies have become extremely profitable uh, within the context of the capitalist system, both in public prisons and in private uh, prisons. It is still the case that it's much easier to arrest a black person or a person of color. Racial disparities in arrests, convictions, and sentences are similar to what they were during the period of what we might call the new slavery. And certainly the ideological effect of the criminalization of blackness is very much with us. 
And as the linchpin of the prison industrial complex, racialized mass incarceration represents the increasing profitability of punishment. It represents actually now a global strategy of managing bodies of color and immigrant bodies and bodies perceived as immigrants, no matter how many generations of people have lived here or in Europe or in Australia. Uh, the prison industrial complex produces these bodies as surplus bodies, as disposable populations. Put them into a vast garbage bin, add sophisticated electronic technology to control them and let them languish there. In the meantime, create the ideological illusion that the surrounding society is safer and more free because all of the dangerous black people are locked up. And in the meantime, of course, corporations profit and working class and poor communities suffer. Public education suffers because it is not profitable according to corporate measures. In the same way, in, in, in a sense, the, 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 the um, privatization of punishment and the corporatization of punishment gets replicated in the privatization of education. And, and charter schools and, and, uh, and then public health care suffers. Uh, uh, if punishment can be profitable, then certainly health care should be profitable as well. That is the argument that they make. And then if all of these institutions can be profitable, then certainly it should be possible to profit even more from the labor of the working class today. And so, let me conclude, because I've been speaking for 30 minutes, and I've not said everything I wanted to say, but let me say that um, uh, from uh, the very history of slavery, and what we might call neo-slavery, and what we might call the reconfigured slavery of the prison industrial complex, we learn also that resistance is not only possible, but is that, that it is the only legitimate response to these systems and apparatuses of unfreedom. Just as we affirm connections between slavery and the prison industrial complex, we should also emphasize the link between anti-slavery abolitionism and anti-prison abolitionism. Anti-prison abolition takes up not only issues of mass incarceration and the way race and gender structure the prison industrial complex, but it addresses all of those unresolved issues as jobs, living wage, education, health care that have been looming over our society since the putative abolition of slavery. We never had the kind of reconstruction, the radical reconstruction of the society that began uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the aftermath of slavery, but that was uh, uh, dismantled precisely because of the, the rise of conservative forces uh, in, in this country. Um, so now, of course, we're called upon to continue that struggle. And, and let me just say that, um, can I just take two more minutes? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me say that, um, now we, all, we, we talk about the 2008 election as the most world historic election. We think about the uh, election of, uh, black man to the president, something that most of us had never imagined was going to happen. Uh, and that's what people kept saying over and over again. I never thought it would happen in my lifetime. Uh, um, but I think that the 2012 election was a much more meaningful election. Because we learned about the potential of resistance in this country. That was the election that was not supposed to end with, the, with an Obama victory. Because they were involved all over the country in all kinds of voter suppression uh, strategies. 
And they assume, they assume that when people came out and discovered, oh, there are only three booths here and there are 5,000 people, that people would just go home. But what we saw all over the country repeatedly from one community to another, a determination, and people waited in line for up to 12 hours or even longer. And I think that was the election that taught us that it is possible to move in progressive and radical uh, directions. As a matter of fact, um, that was an election that demonstrated that, um, that, um, that white men no longer control the future of this country. of slavery. Um, you know, oftentimes people, uh, particularly um, uh, white people who want to be involved in anti-racist struggles but feel as if they are always implicated when you talk about slavery and guilt, that they're supposed to feel guilty. But there's no place for guilt. In, so there's no place for guilt. Uh, and I like the idea that Blackman proposes it. We talk about living with the inheritances of slavery. All of us, regardless of who we are, live with those inheritances. Uh, and we can struggle in accordance with the, our inheritances from those who fought against slavery and those who challenged the colonization of Native Americans and those who fought for labor rights. And today, I think it is incumbent upon us to understand the intersections and interconnections that bring a whole range of issues together. And so if we stand up against racism and class exploitation and heteropatriarchy, we also have to challenge the attacks on immigrants. The movement to defend the rights of immigrants is the civil rights movement of our country. We must also advocate for the rights of disabled people. <laughs> and if we believe in the rights of the disabled, we have to stand up against war and torture and militarism. And if we're opposed to war, and, and we have also have to be opposed to homophobia and transphobia. <laughs> and if we stand up for LGBT rights, we have to recognize how important it is to contest the violent infringement of the environment by capitalist corporations. So, I'm not, not by any means exhausted uh, the list of struggles. I said this at one point, someone was said, well, what about food justice? Yes, food justice is one of the most important struggles of our time. Uh, uh, but all this is to say that this is certainly a time for us to imagine and struggle for a better world for us all. Thank you very much. Chief of Staff of State Senator Bill Perkins. 
to present a proclamation to Angela and Don Davis. Thank you. 